then we are going to uh, get started with our very last talk from uh, Satyana Shakti. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you for your patience. Uh, and uh, thanks for the organizers for the opportunity to participate in, in this workshop. I'm looking forward to the discussion and hoping that um, I try to touch on um, many other themes from other talks uh, in my presentation today and um, on uh, how natural stimuli represent it. And this approach is very much in the um, philosophy that was espoused by the previous talk and uh, the talks yesterday. So we would like to understand, just like um, was articulated yesterday, uh, how we achieve um, invariant object recognition, how we recognize people un um, under different viewpoints, uh, at different distances as they approach us in the corridor. And one of my favorite examples um, of puzzles is um, this figure from um, De Simone and colleagues' paper, where uh, this is from the inferotemporal cortex, so the same region that was discussed in the yesterday session, especially by Jim DiCarlo. But um, so in this case, they present the hand, and then they see a strong response. This is the number of spikes. From if you simplify a hand to a metal, the response diminishes. For that neuron, if you see a face, the response is um, really decreased. But then if uh, the hand is rotated, the response comes back. So the question is how to wire signals from the primary visual cortex that encode to a, to a zero's approximation in uh, the edges of, of the hand uh, in such a way as to be um, position invariant across all positions at different scales and not get confused with a mitten or a face. So there is a large degree of convergence, as was uh, mentioned by uh, Jay Gallant in the paper by Motor. Yes, uh, yesterday that paper was mentioned. There is a huge degree of convergence from V1 to a single V4 neuron. So uh, to my mind, this convergence cannot be indiscriminate. There must be some principles for this convergence. Otherwise, we lose the selectivity that is presented in these um, responses. So the approach that um, uh, we take is very much in the uh, line of um, uh, Jack's um, work and others, and also Aaron, is that we analyze responses to large numbers of stimuli. We, uh, we are not yet at the one million um, frames per, uh, per, per neuron, but today I will be describing data. Um, so, but the general idea is we have as many Natural stimuli as possible and analyze data from V1, V2, and V4. And um, we, our specialty is to do statistical analysis to try to develop models that are, on one hand, have reasonably good predictive power, but on the other hand, are built from elements that can be related to neural circuits and uh, we can interpret them. So today I will have uh, um, two unequal parts to my talk, and the first part will be about um, V2, and the uh, second, um, probably more condensed part, about V4. And uh, for the V2 uh, project, um, we are very grateful to Jeff for making the data set from his previous paper available online. So um, that's the data set that we analyzed. So that's the paper on um, neural representation of natural images in visual area V2. And um, just to summarize the data set that we could assimilate from, um, from the CRNS data set, we uh, got data from about 80 neurons, and there were about 60,000 spikes per neuron and uh, 23,000 stimuli per neuron. And uh, so uh, the key is. Um, uh, the next I will describe the model structure and what are the organizing principles that I think we learned using that model structure. So before I do that, um, I one of, it turned out that one of the key elements of the model is um, um, is relates to uh, both properties of how 
neurons that project to V2 from V1, such as um, from uh, Hubel and Wiesel, properties of these neurons, but it also echoes back to the first talk of um, this session by Oral about the importance of complex cells. So this complex cell unit uh, that I will describe will be part, um, an essential component of the model. So uh, many of you might know that, um, so th this is just a, the review, that Hubel and Mizzle describe complex cells as pooling responses of simple cells each a simple cell has um, um, a simple uh, filter and is sensitive to a position of an edge. So I'm schematically showing just two filters here. And, uh, and then they say they are going to sum uh, these responses. And as a result, the complex cell um, gains more position invariance, although I would also, um, there may be other reasons, other information theoretic reasons as was brought up by the first talk in the session for why the complex cells um, are important. So, but um, if I have two edges, just to introduce uh, pictorially how the results will be represented, equivalently, I can, these two edges and they're slightly displaced, if I add them, I get a Gaussian profile, and if I subtract them, get a difference of Gaussian, and so we can model, we will represent, um, you know, a sum of these filters as equivalent to one can represent it as a little um, Gaussian edge, uh, a bar, and then the difference would be uh, an edge. So whenever we see a combination of such filters, we, we, we can interpret them as um, signifying something of the kind similar to the complex cells. And this is, of course, uh, the model that is uh, known in uh, V1 as uh, a quadrature pair model by um, Tony Walsh and colleagues, as well as um, other groups. So that will be one of the elements in the model uh, structure. And overall, the model structure will be as follows. So we are assuming that the V4, uh, V2, or any kind of neuron, but um, is, um, is looking at a patch of, a large patch of the visual scene. And locally, at a smaller patch, it um, is uh, doing a combination of both linear and quadratic combinations, again, similar to the oral stock from this morning. So, uh, and the number of uh, these um, filtering operations is unknown. Um, prior to the analysis or left to be determined by the neuron. So in this schematic, I depict it as if the neuron is sensitive to two edges and suppressed by an edge of orthogonal orientation. But in practice, in the analysis, it will be determined from the analysis of the data. So the re and they don't, when we model the data, we don't assume them to be Gabor-like um, uh, shape, but they turn out to be Gabor's as a result of the analysis. So then the output of each filter is passed through a nonlinearity, which has quadratic and linear part. Um, this channel are weighted with different combinations, can be positive, can be negative. And, uh, and then the result is passed through a sigmoid, so that's a one subunit. And uh, that's the response at one um, position within the visual world. Plus, um, and mathematically, this model is, um, um, is a logistic function of um, a linear part of the stimulus and the quadratic part of the stimulus. So that's um, mathematics. So when we estimate, um, we will estimate this kernel and then impose the rank um, minimization procedure to find a small number of uh, features. And then this kernel, um, so um, what the advantage of doing this this way is that it can uh, make it possible to estimate what are the multiple features that together affect responses at any given uh, position uh, in the visual world. So um, it's analogous to spectral recovariance method that is mentioned earlier, but is uh, applied here to stimuli that have more 
complex statistics as in natural scenes. And this model um, is a logistic nonlinearity, so it has um, this element of the model has nice convergence properties. So that's the uh, one of the subunits. And then the result is to apply the same operation, so with the same uh, number of um, filters. So the constraint is that this subunit is the same across positions, but then it's weighted um, differently across spatial positions and across um, and across temporal positions. So that uh, I think uh, is similar to the deep time uh, network that Jack was um, describing yesterday. So um, this subunit is weighted. Um, we, we weight this subunit in both space and time, and this makes it possible at the end to estimate both dynamical properties of neurons and their um, spatial orientation at any given position. And uh, then the final output is the spike in nonlinearity, and this whole model is fit to the uh, responses of individual V2 neurons. Any questions about the model? Well, so the rest is, um, I'm going to find, um, describe what are the properties of this model as they were fit uh, to the V2 responses. So it turns out that at each position we found a fairly large number of features, so 13 um, features at each position, uh, 7 uh, or 8 excitatory and 6 suppressive. Um, of course, this depends on the signal to, um, you know, maybe with longer recordings in the future there will be more features, but that's the uh, stage at uh, present. And then we would like to uh, simplify this complexity and find what are the organizing principles among these features. And the first principle turns out that if we look at the nearby features that are, um, so we are looking at the properties of this block, what are the features at, um, <coughs> that together control the responses of neurons at one position? And it turns out they form quadrature pairs, and that's the evidence. So the distribution, so as I mentioned, the quadrature pairing, as in the signature of the complex cells that project um, from uh, V1 to V2 and other areas, is that when we have filters that uh, in combination have the same uh, size, same orientation, but they differ in, um, in the phase of the sinusoid as it um, as it cuts through the Gaussian. So if the phase is 90 degrees, then that's a perfect quadrature pairing. And um, this is the distribution across different features, and we see that it's strongly biased towards 90 degrees. So this makes it possible to simplify the complexity of features that affect responses of V2 neurons at any given position um, in half. So from 14 features, we can now talk about seven feature pairs. So the next um, simplification came when we looked at the um, correspondence between features that excite the neuron and features that suppress the neuron. And that goes back maybe to or Oral's um, kind of uh, denominator and um, numerator um, um, part of the talk. So and we find that these features are usually um, have orthogonal orientation. So this is an example from one of each neuron, so this is a positive uh, pair, now pair, and this is a negative uh, pair of features at one position. But of course, there are an average um, seven of such features at any position, and I'm showing two. So here are the rest, um, the rest of pairs. So one can see that usually when there is a positive feature, a pair of Gabor's, then there is a suppressive pair of the words rightly, um, usually at 90 degrees or close to it um, uh, nearby. And across the population, again, this is now the difference in orientation between um, positive um, Gabor's and negative Gabor's. And we see that they're paired into this um, motif of four features, um, two positive forming a pair here, and two negative pointing also appear, and together they um, are orthogonal. And that, of course, goes back to David Marr's ideas about edge detection. 
that it's um, not possible to have a good edge detection with purely linear, um, either linear filter or the one that is sensitive to um, one feature because you cannot distinguish between an edge of um, correct orientation but faint or an edge that is incorrect orientation but bright because all for a system that is only sensitive to uh, projects onto one vector you cannot distinguish um, the magnitude and the match together but if um, logically what does it mean to detect an edge it means that I have an edge of the correct orientation and I do not have an edge of orthogonal orientation so that's embodiment of that um, uh, logic here as a subunit of um, responses of the V2 neurons. Um, and in practice, I have a graph of, we, we show that if we <coughs> shuffle the orientation between excited and suppressive features, then the selectivity of the uh, uh, V2 responses to natural scenes decreases. So this arrangement improves the um, sparseness and selectivity of the two responses, how they encode natural scenes. Uh, before I describe, so I describe you two organizing principles. I have another one. Uh, but before I go over to this, I have to mention that NRAV2 is actually a very complicated area. Um, so there is some um, debate about how segregated these things are, but um, from a I think it's fair to say it's a fairly complicated area which one could maybe think that there are at least maybe three different types of areas or compartments that are intertwined and they project to different parts of the brain after that. So V2 projects both to MT and to V4 and um, uh, some stripes such as thick stripes predominantly project to MT and pale and thin um, stripes uh, project to D4, although there is a lot of crosstalk be between these channels. So it's not uh, surprising that when um, during previous analysis of the D2 data, uh, people usually find multiple populations. And usually people find at least two major subpopulations of the two neurons. So not only in the, of course, in the data set that we are analyzing from GX lab, but also um, in other types of data, so from um, uh, David Van Essen's and Jan Dan's lab analyzed and, um, V2 the responses and also found <coughs> two subpopulations of neurons. And then we are, of course, are also finding two subpopulations of neurons. In our case, it is by the angular deviation, and by that I mean by how homogeneously tuned to orientations are neurons at any one position, and that agrees with, um, um, uh, correct, uh, well, at least qualitatively, with the characterization um, by um, uh, from the Enzyme publication and Young Dan's group. And for example, here um, we would have um, neurons that have small angular deviation, meaning that all the excitatory features have approximately the same orientation. And then there are other neurons, we call them non-homogeneously tuned neurons, which at any one position are tuned to a number of orientations. And then if you plot the distribution um, of, um, across the population, so the angular deviation is on the x-axis, and how many neurons in this uh, population of uh, with two neurons that we analyze, one can see a clear separation into two classes, and that's how we color them into green and blue for homogeneously tuned and for non-homogeneously tuned. <coughs> but the interesting part is that in addition to this classification based on um, uh, tuning into spatial features, a Jonathan Victor lab here in this paper um, showed that the V2 neurons, they classify V2 neurons not by the spatial properties, but by the temporal properties as integrators and differentiators. And now, because we actually have uh, data on, um, from the model, as I mentioned, this also includes the dynamics of how these neurons pull responses across time, we could also see, um, compare their temporal kernels. And uh, it turns out that the neurons that have non homogeneous between orientations 
are more integrating in time, and the neurons that are homogeneously tuned for orientations are more differentiating in time. So I think this makes it possible to unite uh, different studies of the two populations that either characterize neurons based on the dynamics of uh, temporal dynamics or based on their spatial properties to actually uh, provide the correspondence that this is uh, indeed just two populations and um, homogeneous to um, the um, uniformity of orientation goes back, goes together with differentiation in time and integration in time goes together with more complex um, signals in the spatial domain. So, and then, um, so with this, I will tell you um, that now that I told you there are two populations, I will just briefly mention that this cross orientation suppression that I talked about before, that was for the homogeneously tuned population, but it's also observed for this non-homogeneously tuned um, uh, population of neurons. So here is an example of all features at one, you know, locally at one position within the visual field. And uh, blue again are excitatory gobor here, red are suppressive gobor pair, and one can see that locally for each excitatory gobor pair, one can find a nearby suppressive gobor pair. So, um, and across the population of the subpopulation of these heterogeneously tuned um, cells, again there is a strong bias. Um, um, towards 90 degrees, meaning that the cross orientation suppression is observed for all kinds of V2 neurons, whether they are homogeneously tuned or uh, heterogeneously tuned in terms of orientation. So the last um, uh, finding that um, I can report is pertains to this um, second part of the model. So, so far we discussed what are the properties more locally, and we are still talking about a single V2 responses, but what are the, um, I call them, pooling properties across positions, even though there is a strong overlap between, um, the feed, uh, between these response domains. So here we found, I think, an interesting observation that in 25% um, uh, in uh, three quarters of neurons, the pooling was uniform. And it's consistent with position invariance, so it can be used by eye movements. But in the one quarter of the cases, the pooling was interesting that it was biphasic, meaning that some locations were weighted with negative weights, so the dark colors go with negative weights, and the positive color goes, um, the brighter color go with positive weights. So one can see that the biphasic pooling where um, the pooling goes from negative to positive or from negative to positive to negative again. And I couldn't help but notice that this um, pooling mask look just like Hugo and Wiesel's uh, depictions of simple cells. So this is with respect to the stimulus, and this is with respect to the putative V1 output. And we find that in a quarter of cases, the pooling is um, biphasic, and uh, um, um, across space. So these, uh, these cells are interesting because uh, we have talked about, uh, discussed uh, textures, and that's initiated um, by Errol and Tony Motion's work, but, um, and also other groups. But so what does that mean when we have these um, pooling masks that are uneven? So to my mind, my, my explanation is that uniform pooling masks can mediate selectivity to patches of texture. So the texture itself is described by what are the features that the neurons is sensitive to, and then we pull locally the responses, so we get a uniform, um, more or less uniform selection, selection for a patch of texture. But when we have a pulling mask that goes between negative and positive, then of course that's a selectivity for an, a break in texture, or for edges uh, that are defined by changing in textures. And then, of course, such edges are also common in the visual world, uh, they are called second order edges, and selectivity for, <coughs> for these edges was reported in area two. And uh, now I think we have a mechan more mechanistic explanation of how this selectivity um, takes place. 
So um, one can ask how are so this model has a number of components and uh, following up on um, the discussion yesterday about how one can tune in and tune out to different parts of the model, we can ask in this model um, what elements of the model are relatively important or not. So we did this analysis, so on the y-axis is always our full model, we call it a quadratic convolutional model because it is um, um, convolutional is this pulling mass on the second layer and the quadratic meaning that um, it has multiple features at any position. <coughs> and then if um, we eliminate either position invariance, such as the pulling, meaning so that it into multiple features but uh, being position invariant, or um, uh, eliminating, um, this would be more analogous to a deep network, so they don't have a quadratic component, but they're sensitive to single feature that is being pulled. And um, finally, if you eliminate both position invariance and um, impose selectivity to single feature in any position, then the performance um, drops. Um, so, um, are there any questions? So, I think I would like to summarize the V2 part of um, my talk by saying that you know, signals we know are progressing from V1 to V2 to V4 and MT. And in V1, we know that um, responses of many neurons are uh, sensitive to combinations of quadrature pairs. And these quadrature pairs um, often form a, um, form a cross orientation suppression. And in V2, we see evidence of both of these mechanisms, but combined now as this um, a combination of these four, you know, two pairs, um, two quadrature pairs of orthogonal orientation now form a motif that is arranged in different positions that remains to be more fully investigated, but we observe that there are two classes, more homogeneously tuned in terms of orientation and more heterogeneously tuned uh, in terms of orientation, and presumably they project to different parts. Um, either V4 and or MT, um, and one can, um, and that would be consistent with them, with them having different temporal dynamics. And then um, we see that for both of these classes, in approximately the same fractions, we, we see that there is um, uniform or biphasic pooling of these uh, presumed subunits or combinations of subunits. Uh, of V1 neurons, and um, so that was uh, published last year. And um, now I will, um, what I planned was I'm going to briefly summarize um, the work, the analysis of V4 data. Um, this was data was collected together with um, John Reynolds laboratory, and um, because we already had a discussion of um, V4 responses. Um, um, yesterday. So um, what um, the analysis that we did in some time ago was a more simple model involved finding um, what are the two most uh, dominant features that accounted for the responses of V4 neurons uh, to sets of natural scenes. So it was a simplified version of this model where um, instead of many subunits we only had Two. And um, echoing, of course, the foundational work by uh, Jay Gallant and Anita and Ed Corner, we found that um, these two features, uh, this is for one example of V4 neurons, but um, these two features were often uh, indicated some activity to curvature. But in addition, what is interesting is that if you look at these features, then um, then they are often, one can describe them as what one could call a curved gabor, meaning that what was a straight edge now becomes a curved edge, but in the direction perpendicular to the edge, we can have a feature that goes um, from negative, uh, from positive to negative, so that's like a um, sign, uh, like here, and uh, 
here it will be the loss between uh, positive, negative, positive, so that's more analogous to the cosine as in this part. So one can see the evidence of um, uh, that the quadrature theory is preserved, but not with respect to uh, straight contours, but now with respect to curved contours. And um, of course, uh, Different V4 neurons are sensitive to different curvatures, as Anita pointed out yesterday. So some neurons are more tuned to curvature and some are less. So here is another example of a, a V4 neuron and its two dominant features. And in this case, you might can see that there's little selectivity for curvature. Um, and uh, But again, one can see that there is an um, arrangement of quadrature pairing is preserved. And, um, and actually we found the trade-off, so it's that neurons that were uh, more uh, selective for um, higher, tighter curvature were less position invariant. And one can um, um, have an intuition for this. So for example, if I would like to encode a shape of an object, so the positions where curvature is changing faster, I need to know that position more accurately than the position of um, an edge that is straight. So um, I think computationally it was um, hypothesized as one of the principles of building invariant feature selectivity that one cannot integrate too fast across positions without losing the selectivity. So, and what is the right balance of um, how, how quickly one can increase the complexity of features and how quickly one can increase um, um, invariance. And uh, what we find here is that from responses of um, <coughs> natural scene that there is a trade-off that you either increase one or the other. And then um, we actually tested this prediction on a different data set now, synthetic data set, um, and that's the paper that was mentioned yesterday. But here are in, uh, two V4 neurons that are probed with line segments of, um, of three line segments that either form tight curvatures or not. And uh, for each neuron we show here the responses that were about 95% of the maximum rate. And what we found is that the neurons that were sensitive, uh, that were um, sensitive locally to more shallow shapes had more of a position invariance than neurons that uh, were selective for tidal curvature. So, um, so then I would like to um, acknowledge uh, the many students who contributed to this work over the years. So um, as I mentioned, it's a lot of statistical analysis and um, it, 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 uh, between the predictive power of 0.25 and 0.26, it's been an exciting year. Um, so, um, so the V2 work was predominantly um, uh, the work by Ryan Rohenkamp, but he built on many years of effort by, from Jeffrey Gerald who developed ways to fit multiple features, Joel Cardell who recent, um, last year published a paper on how to find um, low rank solutions to this problem. We were helped by Michael Eichenberg, who I think is now in Jeff Gallant's lab. And, um, um, so the before work was done with uh, John Reynolds, with Jude Mitchell, and Minjun Ko, who is here in the audience, and Anya Van Nandi. So thank you for your attention. That was really nice. Um, the cross orientation suppression. Um, we know that's true for a lot of V1 cells, so I'm wondering, in your model, it looks like you're positing that that's happening in V2. I'm wondering how much no, of that um, in V1. Um, I don't, so I, I think we need to posit that it is in V2. I mean, I think it does happen in V1. Um, 
But you know, the RMV2 model is a hierarchical model. It's adding additional cross orientation. No, I don't think it is additional. I I interpret these um, you know, I interpret this um, that um, we see signatures of V2 or V1 subunits. Yeah, so, how, how would you know that, Nero? How could you know that from, unless you had intracellular data? So, what, you, you know, of you course, they measure cross orientation suppression in V1. It, just it, it has same. been measured many, many times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you're basically asking if the bandwidths and distributions of cross orientation in V2 are the same as V1. In which case you would sure. argue that so, it's public hierarchy. So, you know, based okay. on the structure of the hierarchical model, I think that, you know, what we see here is um, the dominant V1 subunits that project to that V2 neuron. And uh, the subunit, so they project together in combination. So what I would like to interpret this, that this is maybe, you know, one V1 you know, uh, complex cell. This is another V1 complex cell. This is and this is sort of their dominant contribution. So um, we look, for example, for you know one um, one question is uh, um, you know the projection from V one to V two actually does not um, um, does not preserve uh, is it, not in terms of quadrature here. It's not as uniform as the projection from V one to M T. So they sometimes uh, have the same, so that's the same motions work. But we find that somehow they group each other, even if uh, the cells that have the single polarity, as in more like simple cells, they find their partner um, because most of the cells are quadrature here. Yes, thank you. What, what, what do this mechanism be sensitive to AM? So, you know, Curtis Baker has all that cool Yes, AM so control. this is what, I think that's an explanation for AM. Um, uh, this is, um, um, I would say that this is a second order grading. So because this is, um, um, so, you know, there's also an argument in V2 whether uh, it is cross orientation suppression or surround modulation and uh, whether or not you see selectivity for the second order gradients, but um, the data, you know, at least in the, um, um, so all of these um, uniform and non uh, so this would be a second uh, neuron specifically sensitive to a second order gradient, so we find them in at least quarter data, per quarter percent data in your yeah. So, so Curtis has reported numbers on, for example, the frequency differences and the orientation differences between the modulator and the carrier in V2. They're po yes, population numbers. It would be interesting to know. Yeah, I think that's um, um, so. One can compare um, the orientation of this uh, pooling mask yeah. with the dominant orientation for this. Um, so that's a, that's a good idea. You know, for a neuron like this, it would be difficult to do. Uh, but for a neuron that is more homogeneously turned in the first layer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I have one more question. Uh, since I have no memory, I can't remember what the stimuli were our data set. They were all black and white, right? They yes. Ah, okay. So you think if we use color, you'd end up with a third population? Um, or we should have, we should have fit, fit in inter. Uh, you, you know, that's a controversy that um, I'm not um, qualified to speak with, uh, to speak on, but, you know, my reading of the literature is that there is um, quite a bit of um, Mixture. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, I, I, I guess um, a, a very gently biased uh, prior is towards um, still having two populations even in the presence of color. Okay. Well, you should talk to me because we have we do have color data now. Yeah. So. Thank you. I think the million frames uh, per neuron uh, sounds. Uh, um, Good day.
sounds very enticing. So a little bit more about the movies or Yeah, movies. Movies? Yeah, so there are, yeah, and even though, you know, it's uh, of course a great service to the community, um, Jeff, that you did by putting this data set online, but even then, we, you know, um, putting these movies, you know, assimilating the data is still, um, still a lot. You know, stitching the three segment, three segment movies into, uh, and controlling for the transients and making sure that the end of one does not, uh, um, a lot of, um, yeah. Sorry. No, uh, <laughs> I didn't mean it. I, I don't know how to put it. I just say that you know, so, the movies take um, effort too. So I'm so used to you know in V1 where it is an appetite and the movies yeah, yeah, 10 yeah. minutes and um, I don't need to worry about the <coughs> end of one and the end of the other. So, so all that there's a for those of you who are interested, there's a data a data site supported by NSF. This is Ken Wang's scheme. Uh, and it's called crcns.org. And uh, you, you, there's tons of data sets that people have put up there of various kinds of physiology data and MRI data. And it's, it's all just available to you. It, it's a great resource. Uh, this is Carol. And, uh, your kind of culminating equation there when you have the alpha over and then your resources and the denominator. Uh, of course, I, I'm in over my head here and I didn't have time to, to study it, but at the very least you could plot a trade. It, it seemed to me that with maybe one further constraint, you could actually start answering questions like how many neurons are contributing to the decision. Uh, have you gone there? Uh, what additional constraint do we need? Uh... Sorry, that's a good observation. We, we have tried to go there. It's tricky. Um, I can believe that. <clears throat> yeah. So the, yeah, so per the performance depends on both the number of neurons and the number of spikes. Um, it, we have ideas about what the number of spikes is. Yeah. Sure. So you can get, the, we did go through a sort of partial exercise to see if we could make an estimate of something like that for, for these tasks. And it, it seemed like, let's just say the error bar on that estimate was big enough that we didn't think it was worth reporting. <laughs> but, uh, but I think it's worth continuing to think about that because it's, you know, that's what, eventually that's what we need to bring all of this together. Right? We, we want to be able to explain everything about the behavior given what we know about the cell, and we would like to place constraints on things exactly like what you're asking for. Okay, so the other part was huge, but what was the ballpark of that? Or, I mean, when we talking thousands? We're talking no, I mean, it was, it was, you know, kind of less than a hundred <coughs> for, for the, for, you know, the tests that we looked at, um, you know, dozens kind of thing. But, but the rank, we, we, there were so many bits of budge factor in it that in the end I said, you know, we're not we're not gonna be able to say anything with any confidence, so I'm not sure that's worth anything. And, but it's a good thing to keep thinking about, like I said. Hey, I have a question about your um, over here. I have a question about your non uniform distribution of the orientations. Yeah. Um what what kinds of images were these uh, natural images? All, all natural photographs taken from, I think it was the three databases that okay, we got so from. So it's not like, mad, you know, settings like these where people tend to take photographs, yeah. you know, a certain way, make well, everything up right. Yeah, and, but because of perspective, sometimes people say, oh, this must be city scenes instead of country right. scenes or something right. like that. Right. Well, it, actually, because of perspective distortion, even city scenes have plenty of diagonals in them. Um, I, I really think it's just gravity. Gravity unifies everything on this planet. Um, we all have to oppose gravity or go with it. Those are your options, right? So, so that means vertical or horizontal. Those are the preferred states. Or diagonal. Yes. I guess, I guess trees probably come. Trees go with that, yes. 
to make sure I understand it's along the same line, the same question. You said those were foveal, so you were were they filtered by by some some eye tracking for with the images? Oh, uh, let's see. So the so the um, the physiology was foveal because they were recording from neurons that have receptive fields near the fovea, and the psychophysics was foveal because uh, it's humans looking at little patches of grading, um, and they're foveating on them. No, I think mean, the, the, the natural scene statistics. Uh, well, so the natural scene statistics, those are just photographic images. So there is no phobia. We're just gathering little patches that are roughly the size for typical viewing distances, roughly the size of, of uh, I think we, we chose something that was sort of five degrees or maybe a little last couple of degrees. So, so that, but they were not phobiated in any sense. We were gathering patches from all over the images. And we had billions of such patches over. Um, so this is a question um, for Aramosa, but I think it depends on some work of uh, kind of they didn't talk about today. But um, so you you alluded to this at the end of the talk that adaptation is or um, the sort of dynamic nature of perceptive field on the one hand, but also sensory statistics is going kind to of be important. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little about whether you think a the um, Kind of conceptual way of analyzing the link between the encoding and the statistics applies when the statistics are not stationary, um, and B, whether the particular kind of game you're playing um, could also be applied in that context, or if you need some other kind of machinery um, to specify and then in a testable way that, that link between the non stationary statistics and the encoding model. Um. Well, let's see. So there's, a, there's an abstract answer to the question, which is my deep belief about this. The history of the topic of understanding statistics is such that we, you know, you start off with a homogeneous model of low order, something simple, like second order statistics. That leads us to a spectral model that is in all the textbooks since the 1950s, uh, the one over F, you know, kind of power spectral model. And then you start to tease that apart, and you realize that, um, uh, well, first of all, that the statistics are not Gaussian. If you look at local local distributions, they have heavy tails. So that's a realization that things are a little more complicated than, than those simple models would have us believe that are still in all the textbooks. Then you realize, actually, the reason they have heavy tails is not because they're drawn from distributions with heavy tails. The reason they have heavy tails is because they're inhomogeneous, things are fluctuating, so contrast fluctuates across the scene. And if you even take a Gaussian model where the variance is changing, and then you average over the whole scene, you get something with heavy tails. So the inhomogeneity is what leads to the heavy tails. So then you say, okay, fine, it's inhomogeneous, except it's not inhomogeneous. It's homogeneous, but it's hierarchical. There's some other process, which let's assume is also homogeneous, which is governing, it's fluctuating, but it's fluctuating in a regular and homogeneous way across the scene, and that's governing the local contrast. And then there's, and that controls a subsidiary process that then generates, I'm giving you a generative model for images, right, that then generates, let's say, intensities. I think that hierarchical, I'm, I'm just giving you two stages of a simple hierarchical description that I think is a path that comes from, you know, starting in the 1950s to understanding what we think we know now about local image statistics, it's still very, very crude. Um, but I think that that is both the path by which we will learn to understand the statistical properties of images, flipping back and forth between thinking they're homogeneous and then realizing, oh, they're not really homogeneous. But we can model the thing that's not homogeneous, and then it becomes homogeneous again, just more hierarchical. That process is a process of just describing the environment. But now flip it around and say that that's maybe the process that the physiology has also followed. That the reason we have a cascade, the reason we have a system that builds and extracts layers and layers of stuff that are more and more complicated, as Tatiana was just describing to us, that gather information over larger and larger regions of higher and higher complexity, is exactly because it's extracting things that are, if you like, less and less homogeneous, more and more structured, and that's what leads to features and objects and recognition. That's, so that's a map, a description. I think that is the 
that is the path that we all as a community are following, although I'm not sure that everybody would agree to that. And <laughs> I'm not sure that they would say it the way I just said it, but that's my view. Since I have the microphone, I'm giving you my view. <laughs> Probably uh, Laurel and Tatiana would like to chime in on that. I've been cut. <laughs> <laughs> One agreement. I'm not alone. <clears throat> <laughs> I don't do Twitter. It, it takes a lot more than 140 characters. <laughs> Laura, are you going to weigh in on that? Yes. Um, I think that um, I'd like to sort of bring in a different angle here, which is that uh, we tend to believe that uh, modeling. Um, uh, images, videos, etc. stochastically uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, but I, I also think that, that the question is, you know, what sort of mathematical tools we are bringing in to be able to understand it. And fundamentally, it looks like that most of the circuits of interest in neuroscience are non -linear. Now, uh, the analysis um, in the 50s, what was mentioned by Euro was based on sort of views coming from statistical signal processing, which essentially says that um, you have a linear system and you put at the input a Gaussian process, then you're going to know what the output is, and you can compute actually the probabilities and the entire probability space of the output. Unfortunately, uh, the circuits we're dealing with are all nonlinear. And the problem is that when you put a Gaussian process of the input, you don't know essentially what the output space is. And probabilistically, you cannot characterize it. Because you cannot characterize probabilistically the output space, then after, if you put another nonlinear circuit afterwards, you cannot characterize what is the input to the next circuit. And then you cannot characterize what is the input to the next circuit. And essentially, I think we are stuck with this uh, right now. And it's a huge problem. And we might have to start thinking about looking at this differently. Because in the end, somewhere, we still have to do a characterization of our nonlinear systems. By definition, they're nonlinear. And the assumptions that, you know, the simple, the probabilistic assumptions don't, don't work. OK, so um, I have worked a lot in the queuing space. Uh, the internet, you know, there's, there's similar problems. There's a lot of interest to understand basically human behavior across a large number of nodes, and it's the same problem. And it looks like uh, that the tools are super limited. And so, if you want to understand this these issues in a more deep way, uh, which we all strive for, I think we have to start actually changing the model. So um, I am I am a little bit. Uh, although I'm working with these tools, and I, I see what you can and can't do with this, I'm a little bit skeptical. I, as a result, I tend to believe that uh, we have to move towards more functional analysis than probability. And uh, from a mathematical standpoint, that means <coughs> like in probability theory, in the end, you end up operate, uh, using operators. Uh, but it looks like the, the tools are more powerful. And then they meet, there might be a need to start actually shifting in that direction. You can see this in the work in, in deep learning. For instance, uh, there were some discussions yesterday here uh, by both Anita and um, uh, Jim about trying to do some inverse operations there uh, just to find out if you're looking at some hidden layer, uh, you see something, what is it due to? And one would like to do some inverse operations. And uh, essentially, the whole problem setting is set up in a probabilistic setting. And I think that the problems are super uh, poorly uh, conditioned. And um, if you go back to something at the input, you're going to see nothing. Uh, and I, I, I think actually that, that basically uh, this is what more or less is coming out. But maybe Hero has a different opinion about this. Um, so I, in the end, I think 
that there's a very complex interaction here going on because the only, uh, uh, you know, mathematical structure we, we agree upon, I think, is that everything is not linear, and if it's linear, it's not interesting. And it's not stationary. Okay, so now, when it comes to stationarity, you know, I heard also words like you know, this is the neuron sum I've got it, you know, I, I think that that's so, uh, from a theoretical standpoint, cannot be justified in any way. Okay, so, and, and, you know, Jack is mentioning stationarity, even stationarity is a that, that problem, huge problem. So, yeah, we have something very interesting on our hands, and I, I'm glad that we do. We're doing, I think, we are working on some very interesting problems, but you can see that we are somewhat limited by the, the tools which are at our disposal. If you start you know, digging into serious math, you'll find out that it's not so simple to apply them to the context if you're interested. Uh, Oral, I have about half a dozen questions that are narrow, and I think we'll better save for lunch. But I have one broader question that might be of interest to the room. So uh, one of the remarkable things about the olfactory system is its similarity across huge phylogenetic differences, uh, distances, so that uh, you see glomerulae and similar sorts of uh, odor receptors in Zophila <coughs> and uh, human or, uh, or other mammals. But there are also notable differences, such as that the Drosophila has got a co-receptor, the, the OR38, that's sort of uh, attached to all of the other receptors and interacts as part of the transduction pathway that isn't present in mammals. And then, probably unrelated, mammals have this massive top-down projections into the glomeruli that Drosophila don't. So, I was curious if you could comment either specifically on the co-receptor or maybe more broadly on the differences there. Um, yeah, there are, there are some differences, and, and uh, but mostly I would emphasize actually the similarities. Because, of course, every uh, olfactory sensor neuron expresses a single receptor. You see it in mice, you see it in humans, you see it in primates, etc. So that's super interesting. Now, I think basically the point of view I, I have taken at least today is to say, look, we have some very interesting tools, um, which uh, you know, let's say they have to do with identification and coding, and we can start explaining actually how possibly some circuits could be built. Uh, but in the end, I think, uh, and I'm, I'm here, I'm going sort of against the stream, if you like. I think we have to go downwards, not upward, upwards. And it's a biased point of view, so just please take it as such, okay? Uh, but I think that Randy was resonating with, with this. And I, I sort of feel that, uh, although this is somewhat known, that you know we have to look at molecular level stuff and all this, but I, 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 I believe more and more that uh, we have to essentially try to find out what are the neural correlates everybody knows about this, but the neural correlates not on the circuit level, but the neural correlates on the molecular level. And that is changing our picture upside down. You know, I have been a strong believer uh, for many years that it's all about spike processing. You know, out of 100 billion neurons, there are only 100 million which do not uh, operate with spikes, okay? But those those on the, the retina. And, um, you know, after all these efforts by a lot of very smart people, somehow we are not moving forward this by processing. Okay? And uh, I sort of feel that uh, maybe there's a fundamental reason for this. Uh, we have to look a little bit deeper. And uh, this is, you know, um, sort of turning things upside down. Now, the argument which was also mentioned by Randy, is basically it's too expensive to produce spikes. So if you produce them, you can communicate information from one part of the brain to the next, uh, or some other part of the brain. And I think that from a theory standpoint, now we understand this pretty well. We understand how many neurons we need for this, you know, how, how many spikes per second they have to produce, etc., etc. We have a pretty good understanding of this at the level of Shannon theory. So it's, it's very rigorous theorem proofs. You can you know look at it, you know, can turn it around, whatever. Uh, but I sort of feel that now maybe the processing uh, is is 
occurring at a deep level, and uh, there is no reason to believe uh, that what we are dreaming of in terms of processing cannot be done on the chemical level. And so that is somewhat you know, uh, raising a huge number of issues. Uh, are we looking at the right thing? And um, so, you know, please don't quote me on this, but uh, somewhere, uh, some of us think, are we in your science like astrophysics before pressure? And uh, are we looking at the right thing? There are a lot of smart people, okay, involved. There's no question about this, but are we looking at the right thing? And uh, if we are not, what are we supposed to do about this? Uh, so, I think it's uh, to the point that maybe you know what's going to happen is is uh, you know somebody that is an astrophysics is going to tell us that it's not about sheep and cows you know on the on the uh, sky it's about the lizard and then you know the whole picture changes so I wouldn't be surprised that we are going to experience this the way molecular biologists experienced this in 1953. Um, I have a question, or, or two actually, for Hero. So, so the first is that um, I, 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 I sort of believe your story, but I'm really surprised that your data came out that it did, the way that it did. And I think we cheated. What's that? So you think we cheated? Well, in some way. I mean, or, or I'm, I'm, I'm basically, I'm sort of asking because one of the things that you did was, um, so you can see, you can imagine. I'm going to take an extreme. Uh, case here, uh, you can imagine how you could break the model, right? Which is you use, for example, visible light images, right? You can easily play with um, images that include data that, or, or uh, uh, electromagnetic data that you can't you can't see. And in the same way, so I'm sort of surprised, right? You didn't use CSFs or anything, so you're presumably looking at a range of of um, spatial frequencies, for example, that humans are just not sensitive to, or it could be for mechanical reasons. And oh, sorry. So go ahead. Go okay. Ahead. So I'm I'm basically asking that sort of a question, which is, um, we. I mean, this, it's sort of complicated. Is in that we live in this little ecological niche, and maybe some of that is reflected in the natural the natural uh, statistics that you're collecting, but some of that surely isn't. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, and so I guess I, my question is. is um, why? Why do you think that you did get these problems? Do you think it's it's a selection issue? Did you cheat a little bit? I mean, we did, we did cheat a little bit, I, and I was trying to be honest about that as I gave you the, as I presented it. Um, look, I told you that I had to choose variables, what s to look at. I told you that we had to make decisions about which cells to look at. Um, in addition, what I didn't tell you, but it's what you're asking about. It, you know, we had to select those databases of photographs or sounds. Those are processed by devices made by humans. Um, those devices are designed to capture the information that humans care about, cameras, microphones, recording equipment. They're sampled at rates that are appropriate for human consumption. You know, they, everything, we're building all of this off of, a, off of a substrate that already puts us in the right corner of the space. So absolutely. So you can ask, is the glass half full or half empty? Did what I show you emerge inevitably because we had so constrained it that it had no choice but to come out that way? Or, um, or you know, is there something really there? I think there's something there because, as I showed you, if we change the objective function, we get a totally different answer. There are a number of things like that we tried to play around with that give you very different answers. Um, so I think that there is something there, but is it, is it a full story? No. What would be really nice would be to have uh, you know a complete story about how if you had to if you had to start from scratch and you had to build receptors, transducers, everything from scratch, that somehow this is this is a good solution. And I think that's that's an impossible problem. And nobody will ever solve that because you're really asking the problem about what, what it means to build a living organism. And if you're going to really solve that problem, you have to know the answer to the question, well, what happens if I'm on Mars and the environment is totally different and the 
the chemical makeup of the planet is totally different, the weather and temperature and everything else is totally different. I mean, that's the full problem. Give, give me an arbitrary environment with arbitrary properties. Um, what can I build that will have the goal of sustaining itself and reproducing? What, 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 what is possible? That, that would be great. We're, we're, I don't think we'll ever solve that. Too hard. So I'm working on a way, way reduced version of that where I'm starting with a substrate and input that I already know humans are sensitive to. I already know humans can measure and respond to these things. I'm breaking it down to single variables that I already know humans are aware of and can answer questions about. I'm breaking it down to variables that I know something about their representation in animal brains. Um, so yeah, in all of those ways, I cheated it totally. So, so the second question is sort of related, and it's, it, it also goes to the question about stationarity. So towards the end, you were making this argument that maybe the prior, um, it, that, that the prior, that you, that it looks like the prior is actually encoded. Um, in the same way, you were asking, um, well, how does the system sort of learn? How do you build the prior? Um, but you were sort of using stationary things that can be viewed as stationary statistics. Mm -hmm. Do you have any evidence? that when you push around those statistics, that there are accompanying changes, right? That, in, in other words, that this is something that can actually be learned, and it can represent priors that we learn rather than priors that maybe we, look, we learn through evolution. So my, uh, uh, I don't have hard evidence of anything, but my um, <clears throat> working hypothesis is that it's, um, it's difficult to make changes to the, all those receptive field properties, because that's, those are population properties. They have to be done jointly and in a coordinated fashion. So those things are going to be slow. Changing, changing a whole population and re, re, reconditioning it so that it's better, better matched to a particular um, environmental distribution, that's slow. Um, so the idea would be you build that up maybe during development, um, and you match it to the long-term statistics of your environment. If you have multiple, you know, sort of sub-environments, then maybe you have to build separate populations to handle those, something like that. This is back, back to, um, you know, stationary statistics versus varying statistics, right? Do you go hierarchical and build different modes that operate in different conditions, or do you try to just get something that works reasonably well across everything? So that's, that's one set of issues. But the other um, comment that I think is worth making is that there is a piece of the system that we know changes very rapidly and very flexibly, and that's the gains of neurons. Adaptation, you can measure it in single neurons, they reduce their responses after you know, very small amounts of time, and they, they slowly creep back, and we know a lot about that, and we've measured it under many different conditions, so there, there is a question, an open question, about how, uh, given the kind of basic setup that I gave you, maybe the gains are things that you change rapidly, and in response to very recent presentations of stimuli in order to do better jobs of coding and preserving resources. And then long term, you make changes to population structures and tuning curves. So that would predict that if you're right about the second part of your talk, that the first part of your talk is, is sort of wrong. I mean, because you're, now you're modulating gains. Uh, yeah, that's right. You have to modulate the gains. If I tell you that you have to hold all the tuning curves fixed, you're no longer allowed to change them, but the statistics of the environment change, and maybe you adjust the gains because that's all you have. And the question is, does that lead to changes in perception? And we already know the answer to that is yes. There are very strong biases that occur after adaptation. They tend to be repulsive. That goes back to Blakemore and to others who pointed out that if you have a population of cells that is selected for something, I think they used uh, uh, frequency, um, and you reduce the responses of the ones by ham some in the middle of the range, let's say, by hammering away with a particular spatial frequency, so they adapt. Um, subsequently, you get perceptual biases that are repulsed away from the adapter, and that can be easily explained by just thinking about a, even a simple weighted readout from the population. If you did a Bayesian version of that, you get the same kind of biases. So it's, I think it's consistent with the story I told you. But, but actually putting all that together and showing it across you know, many systems is it's hard. It, really, it should happen. I hope it will. <clears throat> I'm glad to hear uh, adaptation come into the picture and the consideration of which priors are, in some sense, original, uh, whether they are original genetically through the process of evolution or original epigenetically uh, through some record of early experience, and to what degree 
um, perceptual coding is, is dynamic. And that's, that's uh, raised by the question of adaptation, which is an almost universal phenomenon. Sometimes it's fatigue. Um, sometimes that adaptation might be a circuit property. Sometimes that adaptation might be an intracellular property. And at the point where it's an intracellular property, uh, for instance, in, in, in Dan Margolius, just talk where there seems to be intracellular changes in conductance that belong to that neuron and are not a circuit property, uh, then it gets us to the place where those internal changes, uh, perhaps the contribution of internal changes to adaptation, overlaps with the concept of what we mean by memory, um, and uh, therefore might be coded by intercellular processes. I'm sort of trying to move us now to some of the more general themes that have uh, come up. That's one of them. So the question of the priors uh, looms large uh, behind many of these talks, whether they're the long-term priors or the short-term priors. Um, and uh, the question of how fast circuits can adapt or individual neurons can adapt, I think, is an open question. With respect to the other question that's come up a lot, which is by looking where spikes are, are we looking where the light is? That's what I said the other day. Um, I think we might want to think about spikes in a couple of different ways, because they have different meanings in different systems. In long-distance myelinated axons, they're clearly about getting information from here to there really fast. Uh, and they are the result of some kind of local computation that then sends that over a long distance. However, uh, an awful lot of unmyelinated axons are really, really, really local. Uh, and they represent some kind of a, a processing unit that's local. One word that has almost not been mentioned in the last few days is the word inhibition. Uh, it comes up a little bit, lateral inhibition, blah, blah, blah. But it's a very important uh, phenomenon given how many, what large percentage of the neurons in the central nervous system are inhibitory. And inhibition is not just some minus, you know, minus quantity added to some plus quantity. Uh, inhibition for the postsynaptic cells may drive them into a non-spiking hyperpolarized regime. And it's in that regime, which we know from our unfortunately limited intracellular recordings, where a hell of a lot of computation takes place. And when that computation results in a spike, we think, aha, it's a decision and it's sent a spike. But that spike also reverberates through the entire cell, not just the axon hillock, down to the destination. And it actually clears out, or in some sense resets, a hell of a lot of what's going on inside the cell. So we could view some spikes in local neurons as not communicating information, but deciding to clear the register for new computations. So let's be open-minded about things other than spikes but also, let's think about what spikes really are. I'd like to anyone like like who wants to argue or make a similarly a general, generalized or foolish point, please go ahead. This is the moment when we should go for synthesis. Well, I think that they're building theoretical models across circuits, but there are also uh, papers where a similar neuron is modeled across circuits. And they are Separate neuron or be a group of compartments. 
So today's deep nets are very primitive rodents with <laughs> huge numbers of uh, very stupid neurons. Well, actually, rodents have more complicated dendrites than yeah. mammals because, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, they do more with their cellular network. Yeah. And so you know, we have more neurons than mouse, but um, they have more cellulose. It's an interesting now. Okay. Um, so, way over here. And in somatic gastric ganglion, we have very few neurons and a very complex uh, neuromodulatory environment that creates a lot of complexity. So there are a lot of different solutions available to organisms depending on their evolutionary constraints, like for example. Um, and that gets us to a point that we've talked about here, and we don't have to talk about it right now, but I'd love to hear someone take this up a bit, which is uh, several times we've heard uh, and STD may be sort of an example of it. Several times we've heard, let's compute with chemistry. I think uh, that sounds great, right? But can it work? Uh, what does that mean? How, how you know, can we flesh that out? In thinking about it, I can think of one, I think it's a pretty good example, there are hopefully our experts here who can uh, uh, speak to it. Uh, one example where we clearly do compute with chemistry, which is in Circadian clock, right? That's that's you know figuring out how much time has elapsed. Um, that's computed with chemistry, and that's counting a form, right? It's 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 counting the duration of time that's elapsed, which is a useful quantity. Um, can we? And and we've seen other examples. We've talked about the cost of spikes, um, and uh, so uh, how we might how the nervous system might use regulate that, um, and we've seen examples of uh, sub-spike, sub-cellular uh, uh, calculations or uh, uh, me mechanisms to establish memories. But that's not it's quite the same thing as the generic let's compute with chemistry. Though. So I think, is, is I guess I'm asking the question, uh, and I don't want to move the, the Conversation in a different direction, but I sort of think it's consistent with what David Carter was just raising a moment ago. Is that plausible? What would that look like? Can that work? Yeah. Um, um, I'll make some comments. So there are papers um, that, um, you know, that argue that intracellular networks play the role of the nervous system for unicellular <coughs> organisms. And ultimately, uh, whether or not you're a human or a bacterium, you need to make decisions and you need to respond to signals in the environment. And whether or not you have a nervous system is kind of uh, up to the you know, it's, it's internal problem. And uh, but you still have um, so that that's what they do. And just like um, there is adaptation in the nervous system, there is adaptation but you have to metaxis is a canonical model of adaptation. There are nonlinearities, they're the same nonlinearities that we have here. And um, you know there are information theoretical reasons for why we want to prefer a sigmoidal nonlinearity to minimal um, model that relates input to output under the argument um, argument of the sigmoid. So and you know incidentally these uh, sigmoids are everywhere they're in the nervous system but they're also in the transcription factors. Um, so uh, as a the, you know, the theoretical view is that this is all about information processing with, you know, just like, you know, sometimes people say that um, in biological systems, we have a pathway. Um, this activates that prescription. So it's kind of a linear pathway. And then people say, well, it's incomplete. There is a lot of crosstalk. And how can you model this? Well, and you say, well, take a look at the receptive field. It's uh, a linear filter. <laughs> Followed by nonlinearity. So, if I have a pathway, it's um, a combination of all kinds of inputs weighted appropriately back to nonlinearity. Uh, so, that could be a good Some of the recent efforts in molecular biology are towards that 
um, applying, you know, what one could argue a system identification that was developed in neuroscience to intercellular signaling. Uh, I have a question. I want to ask, but I'll start. I have a response to the answer question. But let me try to get the response very quickly. Um, one of the mechanisms that one sees in intracellular chemistry is the dimerization of uh, molecules uh, that then changes the, their binding properties. And this naturally implements the logic gates. And then you follow that a little bit, you say, oh, yeah, we have AND gates, OR gates, and so on. Uh, and that could be one answer to that is the start of an answer to that uh, uh, to your question, Dan, about okay, how could we exploit these chemical message uh, mechanisms in order to um, carry out computations? That then uh, totally separate was the question that I hold. I'm genuinely interested in hearing responses to every one of the speakers, but. Doris Sow to this question. Doris Sow, which was in the set of questions that we circulated, right? She, she published this wonderful um, face. It was her lab, and I think I'm doing the usual injustice to the first author who did all the work, but uh, I've got to code this, Doris's paper, on, on uh, the coding of um, uh, how, how the neurons in the face area, uh, it, of course, was in the gut. Um, coded faces. And Chuck Stevens took her data set and said, look, this, uh, this scheme for coding faces in macaque looks identical to the scheme for coding uh, odors in the fly. And one of the striking things about the code was this normalization. That, and now I'm not quite sure I'm going to state it correctly, because I read this hastily and I didn't have had time to go back to it. But if I got the message correctly, in both situations, what you saw was that the, you saw very sparse coding, so that the mean number of spikes across the neurons that responding to a given odor or a given face was 10, something like uh, that. Um, so one neuron would get three, and another would get two and five, and most of the neurons would be silent. Um, now, I, I may have got that wrong in the first, if I got it wrong, people just straighten me out. But it looked like we were headed there to something that seemed to me extremely exciting. A very general story about, I mean, after all, we go from motor coding in the fruit fly to face coding in the macaque. That's covering quite a, a, a bit of neurobiology. And that looked like the kind of uh, general story that we would hope for down the line. And I'm interested in hearing people's reactions to that uh, story. How plausible they think it's nonsense, they think it can't be extended, or whatever. Well, um, you know, I talk to Jack Stevens often, and uh, so I think that the view is that um, the purpose of the ventral screen is to convert images into orders or objects, right? Or, you know, everything has to be converted into um, objects. You know, the purpose of any sensory system is to communicate with the camera. Right? Um, and, uh, you know, orders are faster, so it's a bit different than other things. Yeah, so that's sparsity issue. I, I mean, I've taken issue with uh, sparsity for a long time. I don't think it's a fundamental principle for the nervous system. I, I think it's something that is there. I think the fact that you don't see an increase in sparsity along sensory hierarchies. There's lots of evidence against such a statement. It, it, it seems like it's, on the contrary, it's sort of preserved. You see about the same, under natural conditions, you see about the same distribution of responses in all visual areas, starting in D1. It's not true in the retina. The retina's a little bit specialized. It's got a narrow pipeline. You know, It's got a narrow nerve to send all the information, so it's very different. But once you get to cortex, basically everything looks about the same. So IT, where there's space recognition cells and all kinds of other things. It's not as sparse as people. Everybody wants to believe in grandmother cells, but there are not grandmother cells. No well, cells that respond. Not a grandmother. I mean, he wasn't arguing for a grandmother right. cell. But that kind of hypersparsity, that hypersparsity doesn't exist. Those cells respond to lots of things. 
And the distribution of responses looks about like what you would see if you looked in D1 in terms of you know firing rates. It, it's sparse in the sense of what you just said, Randy, that you know there's lots of cells that are relatively quiet. And then there's a small fraction, maybe it's 10%, 20%, something like that, that are firing a bit more. And then there's a very small number that are firing a lot. So but that's that's not something you can see more of when you go deeper into this cascade. It's, you see about the same thing everywhere. I didn't. I didn't think that was part of his me uh, Chuck's message. I, I well, so one message, the message I think that would come from Chuck would be that you know if you want to convey information in the population of cells, there's there's a distribution of activities that is kind of best for doing that. It balances the use of resources against the information that's being transmitted, and that's the distribution you see, and you see that in all these populations because that's the right way to convey and, and communicate information. So I think that is powerful and useful. But I don't know that it's going to teach us any more about how the brain computes things, yeah. other than what I just said. Yeah. I, I could be wrong. I'm just, I'm just giving my opinion. So I'm, I'd like to uh, respond to uh, Randy's question and also later to what Dan uh, raised. Um, so there is something interesting about what Chuck is raising. There's no question about it in my mind. Okay. Because it's like saying, uh, is it possible that you know some features, you know, in the lowly fly, uh, are indicators of what's going on, you know, uh, possibly in, in primates, okay, in, in facial facial um, recognition, um, and of course, you know, uh, there is a disclaimer there. He makes that this is not about grandmother cells. This is about a set of cells which replace the grandmother cell. In a sense, the concept is, okay, so you have more states, but there's some notion of invariance, okay? And, and that what is, I think, is focusing on. Now, uh, what you're seeing in flies, and, and this is something, you know, um, I, I uh, hope to be able to talk about more length, uh, maybe in six months or a year. Um, what we're seeing is that um, what he's raising is at the level of, of uh, the antenna loop, which means projection neurons. So basically, there's the antenna, it's a bunch of olfactory sensory neurons, they project to the antenna loop, uh, there's another bunch of projection, projection neurons, and these neurons then, um, their axons project to the mushroom body. Mushroom body is associated with, with learning. And so, what one sees is that the connectivity between the antenna loop and the mushroom body. Uh, is is random, uh, and very few of the, if you like, uh, interneurons in the mushroom body, they're called the canyon cells, they respond to odorants. So this is why neuroscientists tend to use this language of sparsity, because very few canyon cells react to, let's say, an odorant being present. So you think about that you have a, a structure here called the mushroom body, has some neurons, Responds to the antenna lobe, which responds to the antenna. And so, presumably, if very few here respond to this, and the other neurons, you know, they have a lot of activity, then the encoding of the odorant can be read out from these neurons. And this neurons is like sort of the blueprint of the encoding of the odorant. It's like in the face recognition example by, by uh, Doris. So is, is like saying, well, these are the basic features of a face. You know this set of numbers. You're, you're going to be able to say what the face is. Okay? So that's the argument. Um, unfortunately, the, the picture we see right now, and we are not able to fully explain it at the level of the olfactory system, is a little bit more complicated uh, because of invariance. What I've uh, shown today, actually, is that the output of the olfactory sensor neurons is dependent on concentration and it's dependent on concentration gradient. And that means that the code is actually variable. So when you saw those, um, the uh, antenna I showed, uh, you know, with, with those colors, you know, uh, antenna look, I showed those colors, you know, blinking, those, this is where you can see the encoding and then you suddenly realize that the encoding is a function of time because the processing has not kicked in to remove some sort of environmental variables, okay? So at that level, you're not encoding only 
the identity, you're also encoding something about concentration, concentration gradient, but that appears to any other end. Okay, so as a result, this code is not a stable, stationary, if you like, set of numbers. It's a variable set of numbers. And then, if you translate that to the face, then you have a problem. Because you cannot, you know, the, you assume that at the face level, all those, there's a set of numbers describing the face, and it does not depend on, you know, on uh, the light conditions or something like that, okay? So, so that the picture is a little bit uh, more complicated, but, but nonetheless, in my opinion, super interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is one interpretation. Now, as far as what Dan, Dan mentioned, uh, then I really thought that what you're doing is actually molecular computing. <laughs> that was my reading. I thought it's beautiful because essentially, I thought you're, you're raising a very interesting question that actually the level of uh, calcium potassium uh, channels, let's say, you have some variability and you can relate that to something which behaviorally can be observed. And that means that actually there is computation at the very low level which controls that. So in some ways, you ask the question, how are we going to go about it? In my opinion, you're already doing it. So the one distinction is that there's no reason to believe there's nothing to push us in the direction except to think that it's post-translation, right? So um, it can be fast, it can be local, it can be um, uh, regulated that way, but it's, it's, it seems to be slightly different uh, uh, concept of what one, what at least some of the ideas that have been proposed for, um, uh, for chemical uh, computers. So yeah, I, I certainly, I'm, I'm, I get that point and I agree with it, uh, but it, uh, that's why I thought it's useful to discuss what are the possible constraints, how it might work. Yeah, I, I think it's what Ira just mentioned before here, can we actually measure things on the molecular level? Because right now we are measuring things at the higher level, like you know, spiking activity. And if we could measure things, and I think we should focus on that, uh, measure things at the lower level, uh, suddenly the picture is going to change because suddenly we start having some substantial amount of data which right now we don't have. We infer about it instead of, you know, saying here it is, okay, and I see it directly. Okay, so I'm going to allow for one final question. Does have a related question about my ignorance of this, what, what's known at this point. People attend to things, and that's the way to deal with the sparsity in the, in the environment. Now, yeah, so, so uh, people attend to things based on, uh, you know, attention mechanism, right? So we look at things because we can process everything and we know how to attend, right? Is that reflected in the architecture? Does anybody understand maybe what you say is sparsity in the structure, right, of uh, the neurons? Is that because of the attention or because the way we have to adapt environment, be efficient and fast, and maybe there is a general mechanism, but it's different species based on the needs for survival of speed or whatever it is, they adapt to this activity, but the basic is the same. It's the, the same environment they have to do. Does anybody stand this kind of process? I mean, there are many, many people studying attention. I don't know that it has any, I don't see any direct connection to sparsity. Um, uh, I'm not sure what else to say. Well, I mean, um, this varsity comes from our cons psychological constraints, right? You cannot process, you cannot perceive, I mean, people study how many objects you can perceive uh, at any given moment in time. So, I mean, attention is sort of collected in your relevant variable. I, I, I was also referring to the idea that the
how it is right? Because the standards are based on the Yeah, I mean, there is a idea of eye movement, where the people will be in the I think it relates to the more general question of what are the features that are relevant to any given decision, and those are different depending on uh, circumstances. So for the retina, it may be you know it's a general you know general information processing machine, uh, but then depending on the circumstances, you pay attention to color, or you pay attention to sound, and then the attention that you should pay. That has also issues with your memory, right? How much, uh, how memory now affects your perception? Uh, like what you know, you know the future, how you are hoping. Then again, the new doctor has the experience. Then, I mean, these are all these mechanisms about what you're going to see in the firing of neurons. Depends on what you're studying, right? Who, who you're looking at. Yeah, I would, uh, in my personal life, uh, this is all encoded in self cortical gut feeling. <laughs> um, and so there's actually uh, you know, innovation between the brain and the gut. And, you know, there are studies when we have a gut feeling, it means that there's a the reflection of the subconscious representation of the way the person is in their prior experience. So, very interesting discussion, but I'm uh, in the interest of lunch. Uh, I'm going to uh, end the question session here. So, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the, today's uh, speakers. But importantly, I would also like to thank uh, the organizers, so Sarah, Dimitri, uh, Brian, Randy, John, and David. Uh, and I would like to uh, echo Tachana's sitting earlier. Give me a second workshop.